Thank you for joining us at Community On Demand. There is much confusion among modern day churchgoers about their standing in Christ. In fact, many believers don't feel absolutely secure about whether or not they will go to heaven when they die or when the Lord returns. Today's message is presented by Dr. Kenny Hodges, concluding his two-part series, Faith Alone, in Christ Alone. This message was recorded during a live Sunday morning service at Community. Let's listen in as Kenny begins. We looked at Romans, the end of chapter 3, and we are talking about justification by faith alone, by God's grace alone, in Christ Jesus alone. And we started with looking at the theme of the book of Romans from Romans 1, uh, 18, 16, 17, the gospel's power both to justify, to declare us righteous, and to deliver the justified one to experience life. And so we talked about three phases of salvation. Phase one, justified from the penalty of sin. Phase two, justified from the, or sanctified or saved from the power of sin. And then ultimately we'll be saved from the very presence of sin. We call that glorification. And so we looked at the book of Romans. I think it's broken into five parts with all dealing with God's righteousness but well, we're dealing with that second one. We've, we, the first part deals with the whole sin, the whole world being held accountable for sin, but then the solution to it, our justification. And so, is this important? Well, I started not to do this, but I had to buy these books, so I thought might as well quote from them. Uh, I, I still haven't forgiven Dr. Che for making me read these because these two books probably raised my blood pressure more than any other, anything I've read. But one of these is a book entitled Salvation by Allegiance Alone. Now I thought, well, I've always heard of salvation by faith alone. What's this allegiance alone business? Well, here's a quote. By the way, this is a doctor, a Ph.D. at the University of Notre Dame, teaches theology. He claims to be Protestant. He says, with regard to eternal salvation, rather than speaking of belief, trust, or faith in Jesus... We ought to speak instead of fidelity to Jesus as cosmic Lord and allegiance to Jesus the King. Allegiance is the best macro term available to us that can describe what God requires from us for eternal salvation. So faith has been redefined, and and he goes through this book, to be allegiance. He goes on to say that the journey of salvation can never be anything less than a call to discipleship. Nothing else will result in final salvation. Uh, You can think you're saved, but your final salvation will not come unless you are a committed disciple all of your life. It is necessary for an individual to persevere in pistis, that's the Greek word for faith. He redefines it as allegiance. Throughout the course of his or her lifetime in order to attain final salvation. Now, you can shake it, bake it, cook it, however you want to, folks, but that's work salvation. So I keep this book. You see, I have all these quotes. It probably needs to go into file 13. You think, well, okay, but that guy, you know, he's not. Well, here's another book. This guy graduated from my alma mater, Dallas Seminary, and is even endorsed by one of the professors at the seminary. And he makes this statement. It's accurate to speak of works as the condition for final salvation. By condition, we mean that if post-conversion works, that is, endurance, love, mercy, forgiveness are not present, then final salvation will not be guaranteed. That disturbs me. The converse of the one who endures to the end who will be saved, which is a mis interpretation of that passage, it's talking about the tribulation, not eternal salvation, is the one who does not endure to the end, endure to the end will not be saved. Endurance is a condition for final salvation. Again, that's probably another one of those file 13 books. Romans chapter 4, I believe, answers the above charges directly and succinctly. Now, we looked last time, two weeks ago, at Justification by faith alone in Romans 3, we saw that Jesus was the propitiation for our sins publicly on the cross. 
Not only was he the sacrifice, uh, satisfactory sacrifice, he's the actual place we go to in faith for eternal life, for forgiveness. And so now Paul is going to turn in chapter 4 to a couple of Old Testament people to give examples of the fact that people have always been justified by faith alone. And Abraham becomes the prime example. So if you look at chapter 4, verse 1, it says, What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? Literally, the Greek order is, What has Abraham, our forefather, according to his own efforts, found? And he says, For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Now, this is actually a, a conditional in the Greek that assumes that he was justified by works. Um, but notice what the boasting is. It's who is the boasting before. And by the way, verse 2 of, of Romans, this boasting but not before God, that's the key to interpreting Romans and James 2, and we're going to look at that in a minute. But Abraham did good works before men, but when it comes to being righteous before God, they're meaningless. And so... His good works were not in the direction of God. So when it comes to legal justification or declaring a sinner righteous, there can never be boasting. That's why Paul says in Ephesians 2.8, you're saved by grace through faith, that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If we bring works into the definition of faith, the only result will be pride and boasting. So he says in verse 3, what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God. It was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now, the, the content of the Old Testament saints' faith was probably a little different from ours. We look back with clear clarity to the cross. We know who Jesus was. We know he died. He rose from the dead. Abraham was looking forward to the promise of God, of the promised seed. How much he knew about all of that in Looking forward, we, we're not sure, but he believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now, I want to teach you a word, because this word is very important in the text. Uh, you know what that is? That's a hollow log, right? Have anybody ever been snipe hunting? <laughs> if you haven't, be careful about that. We used to do that to our friends in Mississippi, our quote friends. Well, there's a mystical creature in Mississippi also. It's called a giz. There's a gids. You've probably never heard of a gids. It's kind of like a snipe. And gids tend to hide out in hollow logs. Well, one day Bubba and his little brother Johnny were out in the woods, and sure enough, Johnny saw something move in this hollow log in Mississippi, and out popped this gids, and Bubba and Johnny was like freaked out. And so what we have here is we have a log. Say log with me, log. We have a gids, gids. Gids and Johnny's saying, Oh my! So, all right, here we go. Log, Gids, oh my. You just learned a Greek word. Logizomai. Now, the reason that you're not, so you'll never forget it because it's corny. I, li I like to teach kids corny illustrations. I, by the way, I had to do that in seminary. I could never remember words, so I had to make some kind of weird association. But logizomai is a key word in Romans chapter 4. It occurs 11 times, 19 times in the book, but 11 times just in Romans 4. And when you uh, author uses a word over and over and over and over, it's important. Well, what does it mean? Well, when you, your verse may say something like, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him or credited to him or accounted to him. That's the word logizomai. And it's an accounting term, and it's used for keeping records. It means something is credited to your account. It's put to your account. Again, very important word. We're going to see it over and over. So there's the first one in verse 4. And then he goes on, he says, To the one who works, his wage is not reckoned as a favor, but to what is due. Now, works play no part in obligating God because justification by faith is a matter of unmerited favor, unmerited, unmeritorious favor, grace. And by the word, the word, the word wage there, misthos, 
29 times in the New Testament, and 19 times it's, re, it's translated reward. So the idea is clearly you do something, you receive a wage, you receive a reward for it. Now I like this. This is my, this, this, I got this off of Facebook. J&L Lawn Service. Now J stands for Jackson Hodges. That's my great nephew. His brother is, is not his brother. His friends, Lairs. They started a lawn mowing service in Greenwood, Mississippi. I like it. You grow it, we mow it. Good, good, good motto there, right? Now, suppose Jackson drove all the way out here and he came up to Stan Shepard's house and said, Stan, I'd like to mow your yard and I'll mow it and weed it and do it. $40, great deal. And Stan said, you know what? That is a pretty good deal. I'll take it. And so Jackson does it and he Pays him at the end. Now, was that a wage or was that a grace, a, a gift? It was a wage, right? He earned it. But now what if Jackson came up to Stan and said, man, I'll make you a great deal. I'll mow your yard for 40 bucks. And, and Stan said, no, you know what? My son Cameron mows my yard for me. And he's the only one that can do it the way I like it. So you can't possibly earn your 40 bucks trying to mow my yard. And Jackson says, oh, okay. But he's starting to walk off and Stan, but you know what? You're an enterprising young man. I like you. I'm just going to give you 40 bucks. No strings attached. You don't have to come back and mow the yard. It's just a gift. Now, was that a wage or was that a gift? It's a gift. And so you can't mix the two. And that's what Paul is saying here. And he makes it so clear here in verse 4. The one who works, his wage is not a favor, but what's due. But to the one who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned as righteousness. Faith is a gift you don't deserve. Faith cannot be redefined as a work. Faith and works are music, mus mutually exclusive. I better drink a little more water. I can't talk this morning. Okay. So here's the problem with the gospel. Some people like to front load it like the first man I talked about. Some people like to backload it. Front loaders say commitment is necessary to Christ for eternal salvation. You've got to do something. The backloader says, well, no, you just trust Christ, but then you've got to do something. You've got to live a life of faith and holiness to prove you're a true believer. Now, don't get me wrong. We're going to end up today saying that a life of faith and holiness is what's expected of us, but it does not buy us our eternal life. It does not justify us. That's by faith alone in Christ alone. So here are the formulas that we see sometimes. Faith plus works equals salvation. That would be the first one. Faith equals salvation plus works. I suggest to you that faith equals salvation, period. Faith plus works equals sanctification. Good works in the Christian life are, are crucial, but they are not what is required for our phase one eternal position before God, our justification. So, again, one of the clearest verses in the Bible, to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned as righteousness. There's logismai again. So it's reckoned in verse 3, it's reckoned in verse 4, it's reckoned in verse 5. But what about James 2? Somebody's going to bring up that argument. Now, for time's sake, I'm, we're not going to do but let me just point out some things to think about. Context is always the key to interpretation. So Romans is a systematic defense of justification by faith alone before God. James is an exhortation to practical Christian conduct. Totally different context. Abraham is an example of righteousness by faith alone in Romans. Abraham is an example of mature, obedient faith in James. Abraham is justified before or toward God in Romans. Abraham is justified before or toward men in James. Abraham is 75 years old in Genesis. I believe he's saved in Genesis 12 and recorded again in Genesis 15. But he's 105 to 115 years old in James. And so... In Romans, faith without works equals imputed righteousness. Abraham becomes God's son, justified. In James, faith plus works equal faith matured. 
Scripture fulfilled, Abraham called the friend of God. So they're totally two different scenarios. They're, they're not in conflict. As a matter of fact, we will see at the end of the day that a, a mature, obedient faith that is acting properly will exi exhibit exactly what James is talking about. So now he's given us the example of Abraham. Now you remember in the law, it says that an issue is settled by having at least two witnesses. So I think Ab Paul here is thinking about that. He's used Abraham. Now he's going to bring in another witness, David. Now notice what it says in verse 6. Just as David also speaks of the blessing upon the man to whom God reckons righteousness. There's logismai again. That's the fourth time. Apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. That is the word logismai again. That's the fifth time it's used. Now, I think Paul quotes this Psalm 32 and then Genesis 15 because the word logismai is used in those texts in the Greek Bible of that day, we call it the Septuagint, but it was a translation of the Old Testament Hebrew. And in, in Psalm 32 there where he says, the sin will not take into account. It's the word logismai. It's the same word that Paul is using all throughout this text. Same thing in Genesis 15. Now, Psalm 32 is one of David's penitential, penitential psalms. He wrote after he sinned with Bathsheba. This would come after Psalm 51. And I think it shows that David not only believed in imputed righteousness, but that his sin did not cancel out his justification. He was still the child of God, a man after God's own heart, even, at, even though he sinned seriously as a believer. And then Paul uses three terms here to show that sin is removed. His lawless deeds are forgiven, sins are covered, and sin is not taken into account. Again, the word logismai. So what Paul is going to do now is establish the fact that Abraham was justified prior to being circumcised and prove that all people, Gentile, Jew, everyone, have always been justified by faith. So verse 9, Is this blessing then upon the circumcised or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was reckoned, there's our word again, to Abraham as righteousness. How was it reckoned? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but uncircumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness of faith, which he had while uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be Reckon, legizomai. There's the eighth time that word is used. So, Abraham's circumcision had nothing to do with him being declared righteous before God. It was a sign. It was the covenant sign for Israel. Beautiful picture of baptism this morning. Baptism doesn't justify you. It's a picture of your justification, just as circumcision was. Now, this seal of righteousness, a seal is placed on somebody as an attestation of, their, of the genuineness of it. And we know that we're sealed with the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 3. And when God seals you, the seal cannot be broken but anyone by the, but the one who gave you the seal. Now, he's the father of all believe because Jew and Gentile receive faith, uh, receive righteousness by faith. And then he's the father of the circumcised or people who are like him. Now, in verses 13 through 15 we see a wonderful, wonderful promise. It says, For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is void. The promise is nullified. For the law brings about wrath. Out where, but where there is no law, there is neither any violation. I, I, I hope you're seeing over and over and over this contrast between grace, faith, law, works, that they're not, they, they cannot fit together. So, 
uh, again, I think this idea of being an heir of the world is a synonym for justification. In Romans 8, we're heirs of God if we've believed. We're joint heirs if we suffer with him. It could not be through law because law had not even been given when this happened. It was 430 years later. So God gave the promise to Abraham not based on his obedience, but based on his faith. And notice the conclusion. The law makes you an heir. If the law makes you an heir, faith is void. The promise is nullified. Why? Because nobody can keep the law. And that's not the purpose of the law. For the law brings about wrath. Now, we see that word wrath and we often think, oh, that means go to hell. Or, and, but wrath in the New Testament is not used in that way. As a matter of fact, back in Romans 1, we, just, we, we read the theme of the book. The, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. The righteous man shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth. So God's wrath is always temporal. All throughout, it's going to be poured out during the tribulation, but there's going to come a time when God's wrath is done. So the law brings about wrath in the sense of that if you're trying to earn God's righteousness by your own works or abilities, you're going to be remaining in a state of wrath. God is not pleased with our self-effort. And then he makes the statement where there's no law, there's no violation. Not that there's no sin. He's going to say clearly later on in Romans 5 that sin existed before the law. But there's no deliberate disobedience of a command where there's no command to disobey. Um, sin is not charged as a specific violation of a specific command. Law reveals clear lines so that when it's transgressed, it turns sin into transgression. Now, when I was in seminary, I had a buddy that had married a German girl. And he was telling us a story one day. She said, my wife got pulled over for speeding on LBJ Freeway. I said, really, how fast was she going? 115. What? And the officer pulled her over and said, ma'am, you know how fast you were going? She said, yeah. I said, what was the problem? Was I going too slow? She's from Germany. She's used to driving on the Autobahn. There's no speed limit. They can do whatever speed they want to. And so, but ignorance of the law did not make her innocent. I mean, but she didn't know. But now, if in one place there's no penalty, the other, I don't know what her ticket was. He probably had to go take out a loan, but... But the whole point is, when there's no rule, there's no penalty for the rule. Not that we're not sinners, but it's not imputed to us. So the point is that the law work system will always bring about condemnation and wrath. The grace faith system will always bring about forgiveness and mercy. Now, verses 16 and 17, I think, are, are wonderful verses. Verse 16, to me... It's sort of a snapshot of what we've been talking about. It says, For this reason, it is by faith that it might be in accordance with grace in order that the promise may be certain to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Do you notice three things? It's by faith, by grace, and it's certain. You see... What we're trying to say is our justification, when we, with, by simple faith, receive the gift that God offers, when we believe in Jesus Christ, we are declared righteous. That's by faith through God's grace. And then we can have the certainty of our salvation. See, I believe you live the Christian life not based on, gee whiz, is God going to kick me out? But because I know I'm his child. Because I'm secure in him. Because I'm certain of that. What a wonderful, wonderful promise. And then he goes into an illustration. And, and I think in Romans 4 now, Paul is beginning to move from imputed righteousness, justification, into experiential righteousness. He says, as it is written, a father of many nations I've made you in the sight of him who believed, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into the being that which does not exist. Now you read that on the surface and you might think he's talking about the new birth. 
But actually, he's talking about Abraham and Sarah and their deadness in being able to conceive and have a womb. And so he says, In hope against hope he believed, in order that he might become a father of many nations. According to that which he had spoken, so shall your descendants be. So the point is, if God can create life in a barren womb, he can be absolutely certain that justification by faith guarantees the promise of God's imputed righteousness to sinners who are spiritually dead and who receive eternal life. Now, his hope was beyond reasonable hope. It didn't rest on his physical ability, but on God's promise. Therefore, his hope was secure. And then in 19, without becoming weak in faith... He contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. Now we see here faith beginning to grow, right? He believed something that defined human logic. God waited until it was humanly impossible for it to be fulfilled in order to exclude Human merit. See, that's the point of Romans 4. We can't add to what God has done. He grew strong in faith. Literally, he was strengthened in his faith. So God often strengthens our faith by bringing us to the point that only he can be recognized as the provider. Then our praise is pure and true. He grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. Now, again... We're justified, we're, we're declared righteous, we're, our position in heaven is settled by faith alone and Christ alone. But because we're in that position, now we begin to bring our condition in line with our position. We begin to grow. And so the justification that's imputed to our account plays a significant part of our development. And I think that's what Paul is beginning to transition here with Abraham. And so he says, <clears throat> being, being fully assured that he can do what he promised, he was able to perform. Therefore, also, it was reckoned to him as righteousness. In other words, Abraham's faith is mature. Remember, this has taken 30 to 35 years of time from the promise until literally Isaac comes along and then he's, he's tested, but... Abraham's faith has developed during this time. So it's reckoned to him in righteousness in the sense because Abraham was persuaded of God's promise. Righteousness was credited to him. So this is a transition from imputed righteousness to practical righteousness. If you understand your position in Christ, it will flow into your uh, practical salvation. Now he says it was not for his sake only that it was written, that it was reckoned to him. Again, that's the tenth use of the word legizomai. But for our sake also, to whom it will be reckoned as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. Now, <coughs> excuse me. Paul is bringing home the point of his argument here. Abraham's Old Testament account of justification by faith alone is given to show that today everyone receives God's imputed righteousness the same way, by faith alone. But his death, he was delivered up by our transgressions. His death was necessary because of our sin. But he was raised because of our, or in view of our justification. Christ's resurrection secured our justification. Our standing is now in Christ, our risen Savior. Um, you see both phases of salvation here. Delivered up because of our transgression. There's his death on the cross. There's redemption, propitiation, reconciliation. All those things we talked about two weeks ago. That's what pays for our sin. But if Christ is not raised from the dead, there's no validation of that. The resurrection is what gives us the power to live the Christian life. It's, it is what validates our justification. Now, I want to look at just four key things in wrapping up from what we've looked at this morning. Four ideas from Romans 4 that show us irrefutably that justification is by faith. First of all, 
Justification is a gift, therefore it cannot be earned by works. We saw that in verses 1 through 8. Secondly, Abraham was justified before the covenant of circumcision, therefore circumcision ritual has no relationship to justification. Thirdly, Abraham was justified before the law, therefore justification is not based on keeping law. And finally, he's justified because of his faith in God, not because of his works. Now, to simplify that, we would say justification is a gift. Justification is not by religious activity. It's not by keeping rules. It is by faith alone. Now, I don't have any slides. I would like just to close, though, with about three verses in Romans chapter 5 because this brings the transition together. Notice chapter 5, verse 1. Just look in your Bibles. Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, having been justified, that's what tense? That's past tense, right? That's a done deal. But now we have peace. That's present tense. Through our Lord Jesus, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand and which we exalt in hope of glory. So it's our settled position in Christ that now introduces us by grace into living for him. And he goes through a whole bunch of benefits from that. But then he gets down to verse 8. But, I mean, verse, uh, yeah, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that we were our, while, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than having now been justified, that's past, that has going, ongoing effects, by his blood we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Now, do you see the, the, the phases here? Having been justified, we, can, we have peace with God, Romans 5.1. There's no works involved with that. That's a gift we receive. Now we can start our journey of progressive salvation. Now we can be saved from the wrath of God. Remember, wrath is God's judgment on sin. A believer can fall under God's wrath just like an unbeliever. That has nothing to do with eternal life. That has to do with the life you're living. Notice, for while we were yet enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. There's our justification. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, we exalt in God through our Lord Jesus, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. See, that's back to Romans 25. He was delivered up for our, I mean, Romans 4, 25, delivered up for our transgressions. There is being reconciled through his death. Raised because of our justification, there is being saved by his life. So what I want to do this morning, hopefully, and I've gone kind of quickly and covered a lot of text, is to nail home this idea that these people who are trying to teach us that we have to do something, we have to be a legion, or we have to prove we're saved, do not understand justification by faith. Paul has hammered that home in Romans 3 and 4 and 5 so clearly that you have to be looking through some sort of theological glasses to miss it. Now, I would illustrate it through my two circles by saying it this way. Our condition is fallen. God's is perfect righteousness. We can't fix it. Our good works before salvation or after salvation cannot obtain God's righteousness. That's why Jesus died on the cross to pay for sin. We saw last two weeks ago it was all sin finished. But what's required is not allegiance, but faith in the finished work of Christ, faith in his person. Then we get God's imputed righteousness to our account. Eleven times in Romans 4, righteousness is reckoned, imputed, logizomai, to our account. Then we have eternal life, we have the spirit, we're his child. Then we have the ability to walk in newness of life. That's our resurrection life, our fellowship, where we walk by the Spirit. Sin can never separate us from God in the family. It can put us out of fellowship, but we always have the 
the privilege of confessing and continuing to walk with him. So I hope today, if, if you ever have had doubts about your eternal life, your salvation, understand that God gave his son for you the perfect, uh, the perfect sacrifice and offers to you as a gift, not a wage, eternal life. And when you receive it, you are declared righteous at a moment in time and that righteousness is put to your account forever. There's not some partial salvation and final salvation when we talk about justification. It's a once for all deal. Then you have the privilege to work out your salvation, to grow in your Christian life in a position of peace and security, knowing that your sin can never separate you from him and knowing that you are secure in Christ, and now you can serve him out of love and motivation of, for what he did instead of serving him out of your own effort and what you think you can do for him. And he gives you the spirit to help you do that. Now, man, there's so much more we could talk about. We could go rest in the love of Christ, rest in your security in him, rest, rest in your justification and then let that motivate you to serve him. On behalf of Pastor Dan and the folks at Community, thank you for joining us today at Community On Demand. Feel free to share this link with others, and please know you are always welcome to be our guest during a live service any Sunday morning at our campus in the Woodlands, Texas. For more information, just click on the link www.cbcwoodlands.org I hope you will again join us at Community On Demand.